Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and assalamu alaikum. Welcome to this cast book launch. I would first of all like you to please rise for the national anthem of Pakistan. I now request your attention to the recitation of the Holy Quran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Mim. Thalika al kitabu la wayba fi hudan lil muttaqin. الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم يوقنون أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون Ladies and gentlemen, today we have gathered here for the launch of Dr. Usman Chuhan's sixth book titled Public Value and the Post-Pandemic Society. The destruction of the COVID-19 pandemic has marked every society with deep-seated wounds whose scars have only begun to heal. Yet, even as societies take their first steps away from the trauma of the pandemic, they confront new and perhaps equally daunting challenges in the post-COVID era. These challenges offer a unique occasion to consider how the mechanisms of public value creation and, pub, uh, and preservation can be rebuilt and improved, mindful of what has been left in the pandemic's wake and of the difficult road that lies ahead. The aim of this book then is to examine the forward-looking possibilities of multi-stakeholder value co-creation, which involves the renewed efforts of civil society public managers, politicians, and society at large in a new post-pandemic era. The book examines many different facets that appeal deeply to public value scholarship, including value stability and transitions, inequalities within and between publics, necropolitics, disaster preparedness, value measurement, and sustainability, all of which represent important explorations within public value theory and can greatly enrich the public value research going forward. This book will therefore be of use to both academics and practitioners of public administration and public policy, as well as the scholars of government, healthcare policy, and economics. Dr. Usman Johan is an international economist and academic who was one of the founding directors of GAS, now serving as the advisor to President GAS on economic affairs and national development. 
He's among the top 100 authors across all subjects and disciplines out of 1.2 million authors on the Social Science Research Network, also called as the SSRN, which is the largest open repository of knowledge in the world. At CAS, he has authored five books in the past five years, including number one, Public Value and Budgeting, International Perspectives, number two, Reimagining Public Managers, Delivering Public Value, number three, Public Value and the Digital Economy, number four, Pandemics and Public Value Management, and number five, Activist Retail Investors and the Future of the Financial Markets, which is a co-edited book. And all of these books have been published with the Rutledge. In the academic realm, his research has been cited widely, and Dr. Usman has testified before various authorities based on his technical expertise. Dr. Johan has a PhD in economics from the University of New South Wales, Australia, where his doctoral work led to the world's first multidisciplinary synthesis of independent legislative fiscal institutions and an MBA from the McGill University, Canada, with coursework at MIT Singua. His previous practitioner experience includes working at the National Bank of Canada and the World Bank. I would now like to invite Dr. Usman Jahan to please discuss his book with the audiences. Please, sir, over to you. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, my esteemed colleagues, uh, researchers. Basically, we are here today to celebrate a common achievement. This is not my achievement, it's our achievement. And in that process, first we have to log in. I really wish you hadn't closed that window. I would actually first like to start with a bit of humor. Um, so, and I'm, this is the book we're covering. It's my sixth book at CAS. So the joke I want to share with you because I'm supremely unqualified to, is that having a new book come out is like having a kid and so I don't have any kids. So the first book you do, we're very excited. It's like your first child. You become a father. It's a very big deal. Wow, I have big responsibilities. It's a big world. Wow. When you have your sixth book, no, it's okay. Hoges to hoge. I guess it's here. If I don't do something about it, I'll go to jail. So I'll do something for it. Literally, it's like that, sir. So when by the time you have your sixth book, it just, just pops out. But you have to give it some love and attention. So we are here today. Uh, it's called Public Value and the Post-Pandemic Society. So if you're familiar with uh, book four, the red one, which we launched last year in July, that was the pandemic. And this is the post-pandemic. So one is red with gray and one is gray with red. There's a little touch there. Um, the connection between them stems from this. Um, the main question is, is, isn't actually, not is, but isn't the post-pandemic world a lot worse than the pandemic? You can address this question at many levels. Uh, in the pandemic, some people really, really struggled, really suffered, you lost some loved ones and so on. So it's no laughing matter. But the post-pandemic society in many ways has been very destructive. In some cases, I would argue even more destructive. Ask, for example, the people of Sri Lanka. What was the big pandemic? Nothing really, but uh, the post-pandemic is rough. And the same is true for us in Pakistan, in fact. 
We did very, very well in the pandemic, mashallah. It was a coordinated, multi-stakeholder effort, including government and society. It was, we overcame it and we ranked very high in the world, actually, in terms of normalcy soon after. But the post-pandemic era has been very, very rough, as you all well know. So there is something to contrast between this. So what do you do when you have to create a scenario of the world um, and say this is the post-pandemic era? One way to do it is that you take different aspects of it and you discuss them through, and then you provide the synthesis at the end. That's the approach I took with this book. So when I introduced it, the first thing I said was, well, is the pandemic really even over? COVID Right? So I don't even, you have to, and I disputed this actually in that I'm not sure when the boundary, where the boundary lies between pandemic and post-pandemic, but it is there because you feel it. Remember 2020 and 2021 had a different feeling. Uh, and now we have a different feeling. Something is, even if you cannot articulate it viscerally, something is different about the current zamana versus that zamana. So then we ask, how do we define the post-pandemic era? What is unique about this? It's, it, and the other question is, is it the same as 2018 or 2019? No. Uh, there's something not... Where we are today is not the same as the pandemic era, but it's also not the same as what was there before. We haven't gone back to the way things were exactly. This is what this book is trying to do, really. So it'll stand as a kind of testament within the chronology of our lived experience. So how do you do that? You split it across scenarios. And so I broke it out into three parts. One is about the transitions and the changes. The second part is about asymmetries and, and, and how dynamics are different between what is concentrated and unconcentrated or powerful and unpowerful and so powerless. And finally, things that you can look back at as well as look forward at, so the resilience and the learning. So these are the three broad thematic areas and then each of them has chapters within. And so the icons. So in changes and transitions, we are looking first of all at value transitions. It's the deep question of are you different inside after COVID is, yeah. have you changed as a person in some way? You know, if you ask some people, they say I'm exactly the same as before, but some people have changed remarkably. It depends on many factors, your age, gender, whether you live in the countryside or in the cities, whether you're rich or poor, it's and so on. There are many factors which I look at. In terms of are you different on the inside uh, as opposed to before? Then there's two economic phenomena that I had to cover because they are the big marks of our time. One is stagflation. Stagflation means inflation plus stagnation. So it's the worst of both worlds. That's certainly true for us here, but it is a generalized phenomena because in many places you have stagnation. Even if it's not translated into employment, it's certainly shown in terms of growth figures. And then there's inflation, which is a very big deal. And finally, there's the great resignation. So this is the question of what is the how do you view what you do in life as manifest at a large scale? So many people have changed careers, they have dropped out, they've started new things, or they've done this and then gone back to the old because they regretted it. So there's a, how do you view your purpose in life? And then in part two, you have inequality within publics. So that's the rich and poor within a society type thing. And then there's inequality between publics. So for example, Rus or Ukraine ki jangori, lekin Sri Lanka tabaoge. That kind of thing, right? Because Sri Lanka was unequally positioned within the global economies, right? And, and so there's countries, the inequalities between them means they can grapple with the problems of the modern world with different levels of strength and resilience. Then part three, I want to introduce you to a debate, if you're not familiar, called necropolitics, the politics of death, which is very, very interesting. It is an African scholar, a Cameroonian scholar who pioneered this work, and it became very, very visible in the pandemic. Then you take it one step further in the post-pandemic. Then there's a technical um, chapter on future pandemics. I studied what are the main findings of the reports that have been put together to understand what should have been done differently. And finally, some question about sustainability when the case study is actually Pakistan. So the treatment that I take of Pakistan is in the sustainability and it's the 2022 floods as the case study. And so it's quite a complex diagram of the book, and this is presented in, in chapter one, but you see how the three parts and each of them branches out. So when you, when you map it out like this and you have this in your mind, then you can proceed to write with 
with, with passion and with clarity because you had a clear model in your mind there's five key arguments in the book and they're all overlapping basically societies are going transitions and it's actually worse now than it used to be and inequalities are much worse now actually in some cases but there's many lessons you can draw from that and that we all have to work together to solve things that's basically the essence of the five arguments you see they proceed logically so value transitions now here's the thing with values you know we uh, for example president cass emphasizes a lot that you have to work at, on the value systems and that's where the real change comes and i think he's right but value transition is a very complicated subject because suppose your values change frequently then you are not really a person or those are not really values as we understand them because values are moral compasses that are quite deep right they have helped to shape what you do these are my values if they change every day they're not really values or you're not really a functioning person but here's the thing if values are totally fixed for you forever that means that you cannot change society unless the next generation comes and so this generation has to die off jis tarah hazrat musa ringte rahe registan mein 40 saal tak ke purane yahudi mar jaye right because they were just so narrow minded that you had to as you entered kanan with a new generation new values so it either one way or the other at extreme positions the truth is probably that human beings are somewhere in the middle that you have generally fixed coordinates in your value system and then traumas can shape it Uh, and reorient you one way or the other that's probably what we are as organisms but what that means is that we ask is the pandemic enough of a trauma to change what you were and how you are that is a difficult question so what did i do in this chapter except it's a purely theoretical debate around these two extremes are do are we totally mercurial and will change upon the slightest impulse or are we totally fixated and basically have to die off for change to happen well the truth is somewhere in the middle so i took public value literature which is a public administration literature and synthesized it with the psychology literature which has done the most work on what values are and so what i'm inviting public value scholars from around the world we are not a big community there's about you can say 400 people who work on this and i know them either very closely or just formally informally but i'm inviting them to say that you know what public administration alone won't give you much unless you synthesize with broader knowledge systems out there and psychology is a vast ocean of research there's just so many psychologists doing amazing stuff including on values so i invite them to work towards a synthesis So how would you do it well you start with the public value system there are three major agents and i have at times added a fourth agent the main agent is civil society which is us right and so you create your forms for articulating values as they are or as they are different now public managers means bureaucrats that's basically who this theory was designed to educate and so they respond to these changing values and they create value for the public that's the thrust of public value and finally politicians in a democratic setup are arbiters of what matters because there's so many values articulated so many priorities so in a democratic process you elect politicians to arbitrate amongst that that's how it would work ideally but of course it doesn't so here's the overlap that i said that human psychology has many things it works on public value works on things but there's certain things where we can work together and so i should probably write a few papers in that for on value management appraisal value categorizations and value transitions so this is what chapter 2 was intended for now this is a very very boring chapter it is difficult to read it is difficult to listen to it is also very difficult to write it's extremely boring but it's very important so you have to put it in there and you have to put it in early in a normal uh, dynamic of an economy if your it's growing very fast then prices will also rise with time because as prosperity goes the shopkeeper and the producers also want a bigger cut so prices tend to rise with fast growth and that tends to then slow things down with time and so growth can then slow down but then prices will cool off too because there's simply not enough circulation of economic activity so growth and prices tend to be uh, in the opposite direction it's bad for us when prices rise but it's good for us when the economy grows 
but there's a relationship between those two. What happens in stagflation is usually that not only are you not growing and nothing is really happening, but that prices are shooting through the roof. And so you really become poor. Basically, one of the key things driving it is that the inputs into the economy change dynamically. It happened in the 1970s and it's happening now and it has to do with energy. When energy is expensive, then everything becomes expensive because everything is expensive. You can't really get that much energy anymore or it's more expensive, so you can't do much with it. So you're really getting the short end of the stick on both ends. That's the problem with stagflation. Now, I compared the 1970s to the modern era, and there are actually interesting parallels between them. We don't have to go through the details, but basically there are parallels of how geopolitics and uh, economy were working back then that are working now. And then there's some differences. And we don't have to go into those specifically unless you're very interested in it. But there are differences between now and then. And I talked about these dynamics. And I also pointed out that, you know, over the last 50 years, between the last stagflation and this stagflation, between 1970 and 2020, or 1973 and 2023 pre precisely, uh, there's a lot of myth-making that happened. And what is happening now is dispelling certain myths about the economy. So this is targeted towards economists to point them in this direction. Right? And then I posited a multi-actor framework in public value for how we can deal with it. And the truth is that if we all work together, you can mitigate part of the problem, but only part of the problem, because stagflation is a global phenomenon. For us, for example, we have to import a big part of our energy requirements, right? So how would you, would you have to solve Middle Eastern issues or Russian issues to get things? So it's hard to do it on your own. And that's what I talk about in this diagram. The other topic is the Great Resignation. There was this big phenomena that happened during the pandemic and then also slightly after it, but it has lapsed now, but it's important as a marker in history. When COVID happened, people became very, very terrified, if you recall. And what that meant was that people started to make big changes around the world, not just in developed countries, but here too, uh, about what they do with their life, because death was something that was visited upon their known folks, and so they changed their careers. And it meant that they looked at labor differently. And so I talk about this as a social phenomena as well as the counter dynamics. And one diagram that came out of that is for public value that, well, you know, bureaucrats are also workers, but they're also regulators, but they're also respondents to the values of people. So I looked at them as agent rather than them as observer. And that's the value of that chapter. In chapter five, we look at domestic inequalities. And I look, took at the United States as the example. Because inequality is something that is very, very personally felt. It's very deep unfairness, for example. It's felt at a social level, and everybody has a certain rhetoric that too much inequality is a bad thing, but nobody says that exact inequality is a good thing because we don't expect that anymore. There were certain societies that tried it, and they didn't succeed in mitigating that because asymmetries and inequalities lasted in those societies too, in the second world in the 20th century. So I talk about this and I said, well, it's probably the fact that you probably want some, do you really even want to address this problem? It seems like a lot of countries, power brokers seem to be okay with the situation. And so if it's a value that you feel is fine, then you won't do much about it. And that's what I sketch out in this study of inequality. And the fact is that your responses to, I'll give you one interesting example. Uh, the migrant communities in the UK and the US were disproportionately affected by COVID, but those migrant communities, countries of origins did much better. Think about it. So for example, Pakistani community in the UK suffered disproportionately from COVID, but Pakistan did not. So there's something about the UK or the Pakistani condition in the UK that makes it different. The same is true for African Americans as opposed to Africa. So what is it about the social positioning that makes suffering greater? That's what I'm really working on. And then post-pandemic, even if the disease isn't there, the social condition is still one that makes their plight different. That's what I'm really working on in this chapter. And so then I talk about whether it should be addressed or shouldn't be addressed, and it's a value question. This is a case study of Sri Lanka. So inequality between publics. How can it be that Russia and Ukraine are fighting or Russia and NATO are fighting? And this small island in South Asia is the one that is ruined first. Or this small country on in the 
Lebanon in the Levant is the one that falls apart. How is this happening? It's because the resilience is different. And so I talked about the reasons why Sri Lanka had built up to this. It's not something we're so interested in this year, I've noticed, but we were really interested in what was happening in Sri Lanka last year. And, and actually, it's interesting to follow up on what has happened in Sri Lanka as of today. For example, where are the Rajapaksas? They're actually in Colombo, back, in, back to the square one, right? So, I mean, it's very interesting to see how their society has been torn apart and then sort of rebuilt. The IMF is not cooperating with them as we speak. So it's very interesting across what they went through and why it happened. And I lay out those factors. And it's very interesting because not a lot of research on public value is done in a developing country context, but people in the developing world have personal values and they seek value creation from their governments. And so it should be relevant and more case studies are required. And interestingly, one of the most important calls to work on developing countries in public value came from Sri Lankan authors. So you come full circle in that sense. Here is a very interesting debate. There is a guy, since I have a browser here, his name is Ashil Mbembe, Achilles Mbembe. And he is the one who pioneered this idea. So it's good if you see what he looks like and who he is. So this is a Cameroonian philosopher. And he built on the ideas of this French philosopher named Michel Foucault. Okay, Michel Foucault, one of his major theories, he was a very controversial and very deep thinking man of his time, mid 20th century. Michel Foucault's idea was that go governments have a unique power in our time. Our time meant the mid 20th century for him. And he was growing up in the wake of the Nazi uh, experience as well as the USSR still being al uh, alive and kicking back then. That government has an important position in determining how we live and actually, who gets to live? This is called the biopolitics, the politics of life. How it builds its schools, how it has its jails, its hospitals, its walls, its immigration. All of these things shape life. That's biopolitics. That was his big insight. And Mbembe advances it by saying that it's not just about life anymore. And this is post 9-11. He says that now governments are actually more in the business of death and how you will die who will die, how they will die, and why they will die. This is necropolitics. It's such a very powerful way to look at the condition that took place in, in COVID-19, in the pandemic, but then also how it pans out now. So I said that this actually has very big insights for a very stagnant, now stagnant theory like public value. There are many ways that post-pandemic necropolitics plays out, including in disease, but war and natural disasters and economic hardship. There's plenty of examples of it. And so I try to draw the synthesis that, well, necropolitics can learn from public value on why agents do what they do. And then public value can gain from looking at the dark side. Public value is a government theory. It's a very feel-good theory. Uh, you are a grade Unis grade beast person. You have got a scholarship to go to America. You will have to study, or great Ikis, and you will have to study this public value at Harvard, at other places. And so it says, you are great. You're doing your best. And government is very important. And you are very important. And people should be thanking you. This is how it actually indoctrinates um, MPA, Masters in Public Administration at prestigious schools. Okay? Just Try to understand what the people want and just do your best because you're wonderful. But actually, there's a very dark side to government, a very dark side. And other discourses in public administration do that. For example, critical public administration say that government is a monster and it tyrannizes the people and, and so on. And so, in necropolitics is very interesting in pointing out how it tyrannizes because it determines who dies, how and why. That's why it, they are quite complementary and they can learn from each other. And that's why I worked on necropolitics. And the deep question was, what if um, the public wants people to die? For example, in the pandemic, not necessarily in Pakistan, but in, for example, the UK and the US, there was that you have to protect the aged people. You have to make sure they're okay. And so young people were disproportionately mar marginalized in decision making. The young people uh, had to miss school. They, they had a stunted intellectual evolution, they had to not proceed with their normal lives so we could protect the aged, which is important, of course, but 
trading in that, if you asked young people at that time and surveys were done, they said, you know what, my life is being ruined because you have to protect somebody who's 90 years old. He probably doesn't have that much time anyways. I have my full life. It's not fair. So there's contestation between us being put to the edge and deciding that, hey, you should probably kill that person so I can survive. That is a very difficult question, and that's probably the deep question about public value and necropolitics. Of course, this is very controversial and very incendiary, but that's what public value always avoids. It doesn't deal with controversy, and it should. Then, sustainability and public value. It was surprising to me that so many scholars in public value like to talk about sustainability. There was a very easy literature review. So much to talk about. Because... Sustainability is a very pyar mohabbat type of discourse. We have to protect the earth, we have to protect mother nature, we have to look out for each other. It's a lot of rhetoric. We have sustainable development goals. But then you see the reality of how corporations are working, governments are working, and it seems like they just want us normal people to do our recycling, and be nice to each other, while they get to do exactly what they want. So this is the problem with the rhetoric of sustainability. I looked at the case study of Pakistan, and this is actually very interesting. So chapter 8, if you have the chance, you should check out. Because I looked at how narrative matters in public value and how it changes sustainability. Because if we have greater climate-related problems, then preserving value becomes very difficult for the people. And addressing people's values, they all want us, everybody basically at least says that they want us to work on climate change. But we're not doing enough. We're not doing enough fast enough, at least. So there were three narratives that came after the floods came here. The first was ki Allah ka azab hai. I heard this a lot. I'm not making this up, but people said that we deserve this. And this is because we have become wicked and so on. And there were people, particularly in certain categories of society, who felt that this is just the way things happen. Why do these things happen? Because people deserve it. Divine wrath. And there's a political orientation behind that and a blame. The blame is in words. The second one, the centrist perspective, which is the one you hear the most, is the one you would hear at CAST the most, other places where educated people um, speak and articulate their views, is that it's a failed system. So we have the resources, but since we don't have the political will or we don't want to prioritize things or we don't plan in advance and there's corruption and there's squabbling and so on, the system doesn't work. And if the system doesn't work, then natural disasters have to happen. So this is a very reasonable and rational explanation that the system, if we put it together, it will work. And if we don't, it won't. And the fourth, uh, the third one is the climate injustice perspective, which is one that was outward oriented, that this is rich countries' fault. They are the ones who pollute. They are the ones who are exhausting the world's resources and a country that has less than 1% of global emissions, but is almost 4% of the global population. It has to bear the brunt of this. This is unfair. In uh, many of our officials who are outward oriented, for example, speaking at the UN or in other fora, use this left liberal perspective. That it's not our fault, we're innocent poor people. Now we know that actually people in Pakistan, for example, our natural gas reserves have been squandered because we didn't take it seriously. So we know how we really are, but when we were reaching out, we were saying, hey, it's you people out there, we're so innocent. And so three different narratives we had to keep in our mind. This is the interesting thing about human beings is that they can, they can hold contradictory perspectives and depending on who the audience is, who they're speaking to, they'll articulate one or the other. Something is kept for the private realm, something is kept for the public realm. And so competing narratives means you have competing values inside your own mind, inside your own heart. And then I built a more specific case study to the floods and, and how you could blame each of the agents for each of the problems. Right? So civil society's apathy, public manager's lack of planning and incompetence, politicians squabbling and corruption, they're all valid factors, right? And so this is how disaster management post-pandemic becomes more interesting when you situate narrative in the question. So it really depends on you. If I asked you which of these do you agree with, Deep down, you might agree with all of them, depending on your mood, depending on if we are both sitting together or if it's a bigger group sitting, and so on, right? If you're anonymously posting online versus if you're being held to account. Finally, in technical uh, future pandemic preparedness, there were specific recommendations made by what is called the IPPR. IPPPR, in fact. 
International Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response. They had set out certain recommendations and they're very powerful, very important. And if we worked at this, we would create and preserve a lot of public value. So it would be very good for us. But the truth is, you have to look at whether we learn from our mistakes as a, as a species, in fact. So even in the reports made by the I3PR, they also recognize that it is human nature that we won't actually do enough about this. And so we will continue to face these problems. And there is one big issue, which is disease X. COVID-19 was not disease X, but epidemiologists worry about this one disease that will come. We don't know what it will be, where it will come from, and what it will do, but it will come. It has to come. And when it comes, you will see suffering and destruction at a level you cannot imagine. That is because disease X will be extremely lethal, virulent, and powerful. And we don't know what it is, but that's what we have to prepare for. One good example of this is what was done with Ebola in West Africa. Because many countries helped and worked together, Ebola never came to our country, for example. Ebola is a very, very painful way to die. It is extremely horrible. I've read into it a lot just when I was for my book four. And thank God that we worked together. Disease X is going to be something worse than that. And we have to prepare for that. That's something I treat in this with the cynicism that whatever the I3PR is saying, if we don't listen, then we will face consequences. So then there's a concluding chapter, which is the five arguments. Again, I pointed to the limitations of my work. I offered future areas of research targeted to public value scholars. And it, this is, a, I think, a good example of complex storytelling because I've painted to you a picture of how the world is, which is not easy because the world has many moving parts. But if you have a framework in your mind, you can help to describe a complex situation, and some of these things will be redundant. For example, the Great Resignation may not be a big deal, but some of these things will last well into the future. And so future, some, a scholar reading this five years from now will find at least that this is a good timestamp. Okay, so this is how thinking was being, um, undertaken by thinkers back then. Okay, this is how they, obviously wrong. And then for other things, they'll say, okay, but that's quite prescient because this is exactly what has happened. Complex storytelling involves being right and wrong like that. So at CAS, we have had now six books. Alhamdulillah, I'm working on three more. Two are edited volumes. They both deal with specific technologies of cryptocurrency called NFTs and DAOs. So non-fungible tokens and decentralized autonomous organizations. That's book seven and eight. And then I'm co-authoring a book on critical polyglot studies because it's always been my passion. And we shouldn't keep this brain just limited to economics. There's only so much economics a brain can take. And so that's in linguistics. So it'll be venturing out. It'll be fun. And these, are, these will probably all come out in 2024. Maybe the ninth one will come out in 2025. But this is the magic of being at CAS, you see, because CAS is an environment that fosters this. We all celebrate this collectively, and we encourage each other to write more. It's the magic of that. I don't think that this would be possible at other places. So keep that in mind, that CAS is a very special place, and here we celebrate this together. This is as much your output as it is mine. So thank you. If there are questions, we can take them now. <laughs> सब समझ आ गया इतना वसीप से मंजर आपको सारा आम फहम हो गया ओके सो विद दैट ज़ारा इफ यू प्लीज कंक्लूड विद दिस वी कम टू एन एंड ऑफ टुडेस इवेंट टुडेस इवेंट एंड आई वुड आल्सो लाइक टू टेक दिस ऑपरेशनिटी टू कंग्रेजुलेट डॉक्टर उस्मान ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ कैस टीम वी एट कैस आर प्राउड ऑफ योर रिमार्केबल अचीवमेंट सर and i would also like all of you to join me in giving a round of applause to dr usman thank you